you all very much for coming down today. So as part of the club development, I want to do more than just provide basketball. And a lot that has to do with about people's journeys to get to where they are, things you need to do as well if you want to improve in basketball. A lot of stuff about motivation, nutrition, sleep, life skills. So a lot of my kids at their 18s will tell you, I teach a lot about life skills and how basketball transfers from like problem solving, leadership, emotional stability and control, and how that translates to real world. So as a part of that, I've got a lot of special guests coming um, to some talks over the next couple of months. We're giving you guys more than just basketball because we want to give you a more uh, sort of holistic experience. So with that, I've got Dan Dozy, who's played uh, pretty high level, he's come down from the we going to take some time for us to have some conversations about some of his stuff, what he does, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So we'll go Dan, from there. Come in. Appreciate that. Well, appreciate that. Ooh, we feels good to be here in front of every single one of you guys. Uh, good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. Oh, come on, guys. Come, on. we got a bit more energy. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. We've got to have that kind of energy as much as we can. Um, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about my story, my journey, where I've been from, and, and, and everything I've, that I've basically experienced, and what's helped me to get to where I am today. But before I even get into that, I just want to ask you guys a quick question. How many of you guys want to be great? How many of you guys want to be great? Okay, thank you. Sorry, I need to, maybe I might need to speak up a little bit more, right? Okay, good. You guys want to be great. Now the question is, do you have a purpose as to why you want to be great? Raise your hand if you do. Right. We'll talk about that later on. We'll talk about that later on. Because I believe that everybody in this room has the ability to grow and transcend in order to get to the next level. But however, though, it starts off with your relationship, with your mindset, and also take an action. So to introduce myself, my name is Danny Dozy. I am a motivational speaker and basketball coach and mental skills coach and all that, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but today, like I said, I want to talk a little bit more about what it actually means to get to the level and actually trying to be successful with whatever it is that you want to accomplish, not just in sport, but also in your personal life. And so to talk a little bit about my experiences and stuff, right? So, I remember making Team England, Team England. And to kind of talk a little bit around that, uh, making Team England was like putting my favorite topping, favorite sauce topping on top of my favorite ice cream or something like that. And I wanna ask you guys here in this room, you know, like scream out, what is your favorite topping to put on ice cream? What's your favorite topping to put on ice cream? Chocolate, strawberry. Anybody else? Any butterscotch fans in here? Salted caramel? Nah, <laughs> salted caramel, huh? <laughs> Honestly, I'll tell you what, though, talking about ice cream, I'm actually thinking about it right now. I shouldn't be. But my favorite topping on ice cream is strawberry. And to make Team England, right, that's what it felt like. It was like putting my favorite topping on ice cream and making England was just like that. Why? Because it was, it was like a representation of everything that I've been, that I came from and where I first started in my journey to then making it to this point in my life where I never thought where I started from versus where I'm at now, I will ever get here. And I just want to say that to pass this message along to you guys, like it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what's going on, it's about how you respond to your own personal life story or your own personal moments that challenge you to find a bit of resilience and to believe. That's what really matters. So to talk a little bit again about England, I remember um, well, actually it was, during a, it was during the 2017, 2018 season playing for Bristol. And it was, uh, it, it was interesting because so I got an email and said that you have been selected to play for Team England uh, for the, in the Commonwealth Games. I was like, huh, what's this? So I told my coach about it. And he said, yeah, just fill in the details and we'll see how it goes, okay? And I'm sure some of you guys know how it, how it goes to make like a Team England or to make a sort of program. And so 
put in my details for the, for the, for the application and then got to the first camp or was invited to the first camp. And I was like, what? Okay, Team England. Like, this is almost something that I wanted to do. And uh, like, said, thinking about it when I, when I finished from university, I always wanted to try and represent my country or make it to a high level in some sort of regard. So I set up my intentions. And when it came to the, the experience of playing for Team, England, for, for Team England or being in the camp, it was intense. It was challenging, but at the same time, it was also going against the best competition here in the UK. So I felt like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm here. Let's take advantage of this. And it's about seizing the opportunity. When you see the opportunity that nobody else wants, are you willing and are you hungry enough to take it? And so when it came to thinking about this moment, my, my heart and my mind was set out, I'm going to make this team. I don't know what, it, I don't know what it's going to take, but I'm going to make it one way or the other. So after the first camp, time went on. They said, you've made the first, you've made the, the cut. And so it went from 24 players to 16 players. And I remember making 16, the, the team was 16. And I was thinking, all right, we're there. We're almost there. And then the second opportunity or the second camp came. And when it came, it was just, again, seizing the opportunity. And now really taking advantage of it, stepping up to the plate, showing what you've been working on and just showing, showing the coaching staff and everybody else that's here how bad you actually want it. And so we, we, we went through the camp and I remember after the last day of the camp, right, it was, it was now time for interviews. So I remember going into this room and I'm like, I don't know what to expect. You know, I feel like oh, maybe I made it, maybe I haven't. But I remember going into this, uh, going into this room and then speaking to the coach. And the coach at the time for Team England was the head coach for Bristol as well. And, and he we was, talk, was talking, he said, hey Dan, you know, we've liked everything that you've done and we appreciate your work ethic and we're really proud of the work and the accomplishments that you made. And he said that we would like to invite you to make the team for Team England for the Commonwealth Games. Now I'm like, I gotta keep it very professional here, okay? But you don't understand how it felt on the inside. I was like, yes, go! <laughs> I was like, let's go! But I had to just keep it calm, though. <laughs> I had to keep it calm. And so I was like, okay, yeah, so sure, great, amazing, amazing. Yes, of course, I'll take the opportunity. And so I walk out that room, and I was so excited, right? I had to go find somewhere and just literally just burst out in joy and burst out in abundance and positivity. I just had to express how happy and how grateful I was for the opportunity. And the reason I say, the reason I was so excited, right, is because the opportunity meant so much that I wanted it that bad. And that's the thing, when it means enough to you, right, you celebrate harder, right? When it means enough to you, it's, you, you celebrate harder than when it doesn't. And the question, the thing I want to say is here is that what is it that means enough to you? Because if it doesn't mean enough to you, you're going to get a bit of success. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I got that. But when it means something to you, you take pride in it. You take pride in it. You know what I mean? You take pride in it. So then making Team England came and it went, okay? And we went to Australia. And yes, we had the experiences that we had. We won some games. We lost some games. I was pissed off at some of the games that we lost. I firmly believe we should have won most of the games that we played. But then that was just my mindset. Some other guys may have thought differently. Obviously, I have my own opinion. Everybody else does as well. But at the same time, I enjoyed it. And I was also ready. And I was also grateful for that kind of experience that I had playing for Team England. Okay? And so then, kind of moving forward a little bit, after Team England, I came back. And like I said, I played for the Bristol Flyers as well. I'm sure you, well, everyone here has heard of the team. But... The 2017, 2018 season was my favorite season. And I want to just say there was so much that just happened within that season that even making Team England was like putting the cherry on top of the ice cream. So when I came back from Team England, talking about playing for Bristol and stuff, right, that season ended on a high. Even though we didn't finish the way that we wanted to, it, we, we finished it on a high. And we made history that season, actually. And we had beat um, Newcastle in the uh, 20, 2018 playoffs. 
And again, when it means so much to you, right, you celebrate it even harder. And so I remember the year before, uh, we had just lost to Newcastle in the first round. And we knowing that we could have beat them. That's the, that's, the, that's the interesting thing. But the next season, we had a better team and our mindset was a bit more better. And so when it came to playing Newcastle in that first round, right, there was no other sort of like mindset, no other sort of zone that you could ever enter. I'm sure you guys know when like someone comes to your house, right? You know, you, you know when you lose against a team and you know you could have beat them, but you beat them, but you lose them away. It's like you couldn't wait for them to come to your yard. You know what I mean? You know that kind of dog mentality. This is, this is, this is the, I can't even remember what that saying is, but this is the bulldog yard. This is my yard. You know what I mean? And, um, and so, yes, we played, we played Newcastle on the aggregate score in the first round. And we went up to Newcastle, and we lost by six points, okay? We brought, we, brought it, we brought it back within, like, I don't know, from 13 to 6 or something like that. And we started to have a bit of momentum. Now, we knew we could have beat them, beat them up there, right? And this is on a Friday night. But Saturday came, and I was like, we're not going out like this. So my mindset was just fixated on trying to beat Newcastle and just trying to lead the way for my teammates as well. So Sunday came, and I tell you what, I tell you what, playing basketball on a Sunday, that's one of my favorite days. That's, one, that's my favorite day. In the afternoon, absolutely, absolutely. Raise your hand if, you, if Sunday is one of your favorite days to play basketball, basketball on. Okay, well, some people like to play on a Saturday, Friday, Monday. Raise your hand if you like to play on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, <laughs> a Thursday, a Friday. Okay, so most people like to play basketball on a Friday. Okay, fine. Well, my days are Sunday, so meet me on a Sunday. You're absolutely not going to like me at all. <laughs> so Sunday came. Sunday comes, and uh, we're playing Newcastle around like 2.30, 3 o'clock. Perfect timing. It was a nice, warm, hot day. Um, it was, I think, was it March, April, April, May, May or something like that. And um, we were, we were, yeah, I was, I was absolutely fixed. I, I was in a mindset like no other. And so we started off and uh, we started off playing and we knew that, yes, we're in this game today. And I remember, I was, we were so in the game, I remember making the turnover from here, right? And I passed, I tried to pass the ball to my teammate on this side of the court. Turn it over. I promise you, this guy that, had that, that got the ball, he thought he had a wide open left hand layup. I did a straight 40 yard dash to go do a chase down block. You would have thought I was Usain Bolt that day. <laughs> really, real, real, seriously, you would have thought I was Usain Bolt. But just to kind of like share that, like just that moment, it's how bad you actually want it. Like when you want it bad enough, you're not going to give up nothing easy. You're not going to give up nothing easy. You're going to take it. You're going to take it. You're going to, make, you're going to let people know that this is mine, all right? And nobody else is taking it from you. And so we kept playing throughout the game. Uh, we get to the fourth quarter. It's maybe about three minutes left, and we're up against Newcastle by like 11, 12 points or something like that. And it was that sort of like victory, like you could slowly start to see, but you had to kind of tame yourself a little bit more. And we get to maybe the last minute and we're up, we're playing defense, Newcastle isn't scoring, all of this sort of stuff. And it's about five seconds left. We've won the game. I absolutely lose my head. I lose my head. I, I was so happy we won because it was about bouncing back from the season before. And sometimes in life, just to talk a little bit about it, when you lose something that means something to you, when ne the next time you get the opportunity, you're not going to let that same thing ever happen again. And that's, some, that's just a mindset. That's just a mindset thing. So we won the game. It was a great experience. And uh, we moved on to the next round. Yes, although we came up short against Leicester, it was still grateful. It was still a great sort of outcome for that season based on the fact that we made the history that we made. And talking a little bit more about Bristol and, and the experiences I had there, again, what David mentioned was about leadership. So I just became a captain for the first time. Like, I've never been given a sort of leadership role or even this kind of responsibility. And a lot of things that I learned about being a captain 
is that leadership. It's not about how you lead others. It's about how you lead yourself. And how you lead yourself is the recipe for how you impact other people. Okay, and if, when you're leading yourself, you gotta know how you operate, how you manage your emotions, how do you manage your mindset, how do you work through the things that aren't actually helping you, or how do you work through the things that require you to find a solution? See, I believe in life, right? Life requires us to do three things when there's a problem. Find a solution, okay, number one, find a solution. Give it your best shot, okay, that's number two. And number three is believe that whatever outcome you're trying to possibly achieve or attract, it will happen, right? So those are the main, main three things. And so being a leader required you to, or being a captain required you to kind of step up, know how to be. Like sometimes you gotta learn when to step back and let other people figure it out for themselves. Sometimes you're gonna know how, you're gonna know, you're gonna know, you're gonna have to know when to step up and knowing when to say something. Sometimes for me, I'm so, I could be sometimes competitive, but at the same time, some guys might not be. Okay, so how do you work with their personality to help them or to help you and to help other people, right? Or sometimes you gotta know when to be, motivation, be motivational. Sometimes you gotta know when to say, you know what, guys, this ain't good enough, we need to pull it together. Sometimes you're gonna have to say something maybe that people don't wanna hear but at the same time, they need to hear it. That's what leadership is. That's what leadership is. And it's also about, like I say, leading yourself. And so, so that's, that's a bit of my highlights in terms of making England and then playing for Bristol Flyers. But in terms of success and knowing what it takes to actually achieve something, my lessons for being successful actually started when I was at Iowa State. And I was at Iowa State for two years, from 2013 to 2015. Uh, well, played with some players who are now in the NBA. We also played under a really good coach named Fred Hoiberg as well. And I say, when I first got here uh, at Iowa State in 2013, um, it, was, it was an interesting kind of like eye-opening recipe or experience. So like I said, how many of you, like I asked you guys the question, how many of you guys want to be great? Right, raise your hand again. How many of you guys want to be great? Okay, perfect. All you guys want to be great. I could tell you right now that to be great, it requires hard work. And when I'm talking about hard work, I'm talking about the work that you do not want to do, or the work that nobody else is doing, or that work that you despise doing, or that work that when you wake up out of the bed, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. But at the same time, your mindset says, I have to. That's discipline, by the way. And the reason I say this is because these guys, like I said, that, that are in the NBA now and whatnot, they was in the gym for breakfast. They was in the gym for breakfast snack. They was in the gym for lunch. They was in the gym for a PM snack. They was in the gym for dinner, sometimes even a late night snack, because that's what they wanted to do. So, and because that's what they wanted to do, it required a lot of personal mindset, personal mentality. It required you to sacrifice everything, put everything on the line. Sometimes, when well, I say in a bad way, but sometimes you might need to sacrifice some of those things that you know aren't helping you, building good habits. Now I got a question for you guys. How many of you guys play games? All right, how many of you guys play games for too many hours? All right then, see, sometimes you gotta understand your time, the time you spend doing something can impact whether you're gonna make it far enough or whether you're gonna maybe stay here at this point, all right? And I say this because the time that they spent playing or, or, or training and, and doing whatever they was doing, I'm talking about my teammates, by the way, old teammates. They, they, like I said, they set up their intentions and that hard work actually paid off and look at where they are now. And that's something I admire, I, I respect that. You gotta respect someone's grind sometimes. How bad do you want it? You know, like you can't sit up here or you can't say you want to be great, but then you walk away and you're giving yourself excuses. I mean, that's like shooting yourself in the foot, but you say you want to take a step forward. You gotta understand, like, if you want to be great, go take action. 
go take action. Do the things that you know you that 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 you know you don't like doing, but at the same time doing it because there is a design purpose. I remember when I was 16, 17, just kind of kind of explains a little bit. But I used to go and run maybe two, three miles, four miles a week, right? And I maybe not every day, I didn't like doing it, but I did appreciate going out and knowing that this is helping me in terms of like my personal fitness. I want to ask you guys, how many of you guys go out and go run? Okay, right. So basketball is, as we know, it's, it's, a, it's a fitness sport and it's also an endurance sport, right? And as you know, sometimes basketball, how many of you guys have played in the fourth quarter or went into overtime and have been like, man, I'm tired, right? <laughs> I know you guys know. I've been there too, trust me. But if you're doing that extra bit of work, if you're doing that bit of extra, extra bit of work outside of the game, outside of, outside of practice, I can tell you when you get to overtime, you're like, I'm ready to go. I've been putting, this, putting in this work, and I know I've been putting in this work, and guess what? I'm going to own it. Got to own it. Got to own your success. Own your hard work. All right? So that was, uh, that was a bit of the, the experiences at Iowa State, along with, with also making history there as well. Um, playing for a team where we won two back-to-back -back tournament championships, which had never been done in school history, and also um, coming up, well, I think we're the first team to actually, first team, first team in the history of Iowa State to become a top 25 team sort of thing, all right, in, in, in that regard. So it was good to be a part of that experience. Um, but however, although everything sounded nice and everything sounds good, sometimes, like, there's other challenges that life might bring. For example, politics. And when I say politics, I, I want to ask the question, how do you guys deal with when someone else might be more gifted, more talented, more skilled, might make a better read or whatever? How do you deal with when somebody has better traits and characteristics or features than you do as a player? How do you deal with that? Because the coach might look at that player and say, oh, yeah, he's better than what I got. So he might take, he might take, the, he might take you for, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't even think of the word. He might take you for granted and say, I want to take this player and put him in your situation. And then the question becomes now, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? So, yeah, so do I talk? Oh, you want to answer it? Okay, feel free. You want to do it? No, answer it. And you're right, like, it should, again, I guess it goes into the point of what we're saying, like, how bad do you want it? Do you want it bad enough? If you want it bad enough, maybe the coach wouldn't do that to you. But if you don't show that you don't want it bad, that you want it bad enough, then how, what's going to happen if coach does bring someone else better than you in? And that's something that I had to deal with. And I take, I take my responsibility in that. All right, sometimes in life, we've got to learn how to take responsibility. But my senior year, right, so like I said, I was there for two years. My junior year was a taste, but then over the summer, I put in some work and I tried to get better and I tried to, I tried to make some improvements, which is cool. But in my senior year, my last year of playing basketball, last year of playing collegiately, right, coach brought in another guy from Marquette, 6'9", athletic, long, and I knew, oh, snaps. That actually put my position at threat. So I didn't know whether to stay there. I didn't know whether to leave. So I had a choice to make. It's either to stay at Iowa State and battle out whatever happens this year, or I leave and go into the unknown, and whatever happens is whatever happens. But instead, I chose to stay. Now, looking at that decision, if I knew myself a bit more better, obviously, can't live in the past. I'm not saying I am right now. I would have made different decisions, by far. But what I want to share here is just one of the greatest mental challenges that I had to endure as a senior, knowing that this is my last year playing basketball and now I'm not going to play anymore. Or I'm not going to be able to make that NBA dream happen or whatever it was. So, like I said, coach brought in another guy. He was 6'9", lengthy, athletic, and he brought him in and played about eight games. I, he wasn't going to play... He wasn't able to play till, till like, uh, what's the word? till December. Our season started in October, 
November. So I was able to play eight games and showcase what I had and what I've been working on and stuff, which is great. But then he came on, okay, and he became el eligible to play, and then that was it for me. I didn't play basketball for a good January, February, March, April, for about a good four months. I didn't touch a, I didn't touch a court for about four months. And I could tell you that was one of the hardest challenges because there was a lot that I had to figure out for myself. A lot of things in life just came up. I wasn't mentally in the best space. Yes, physically I might have been there, might have been present, but mentally I was out of it. And I couldn't leave, I couldn't go anywhere, and I was basically just stuck. And thinking about it now and, 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 and Remembering being in the space, I almost thought about, I don't want to be here anymore. Although, yes, I'll show up to practice and show up to games. At some point, I generally didn't want to be here anymore. But it was a piece of reflection that I had to remember that, first of all, where I've came from and where I'm at now, not too many people would have made it. And it was my story. It was my story, it was my journey that I had to think about of all the sort of battles and everything that I came from. And to know that where I'm at today, I've come too far to quit. I've come way too far to quit. So why do I need to, why would I want to throw in the towel now? All right, so it, although it sucks and it's not what I hoped it to be or what I wanted it to be, at least just make it the best that you possibly can. Sometimes in life, like yes, not every situation is the best for us. And some of it isn't fair. But it's how you make the best out of those worst set of circumstances and get them to work in your favor. And I'd like to share with you my story here today. Can I share with you my story? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, yes, I sound American. I lived in America for quite some time, right? Uh, but I was actually born here in London. And I was born here in London, a uh, single-parent household, just my mother and I. And um, we were moving around a lot in the early days of our venture here in England. And grew up moving places, going from one school to another, going from one school to another, moving from one country to another, going from England to New York to Nigeria, back to England, back to Boston, back to England, back to Boston. Loads of instability. But I must say that in that time when all this instability is taking place, the most important thing is to find a bit of personal stability. Because sometimes life, we don't know what's gonna happen. And we can't be too shaken up all the time. Sometimes we gotta figure out how to ground ourselves. So when we moved to America in 2004, this is the third time we've been to America, life now is completely unpredictable and confusing as well. So we moved to America, came in on a three-month visa. And when we came in on this three-month visa, I thought, okay, maybe we're going to go spend some time with some family members. And we have family members in New York, Texas, and Florida. But when we landed in Boston, my mother didn't want to go to any of those places. And I was, as an as a 11-year-old, so confused. I was like, okay, whatever happens, whatever happens. So I just had to go along with the journey. Shortly after landing in Boston, we moved to Las Vegas. And we moved to Las Vegas, uh, taking a three-day bus trip across America from Boston to Las Vegas, traveling throughout the night, uh, throughout the day sometimes, uh, laying over in all sorts of different places. And it was a journey. But then when we got to Las Vegas, we got to Las Vegas and we didn't know what we was doing there. I didn't know what we was doing there. Still to this day, I didn't understand why. We didn't have any family members or nobody like that. And so when we got to Las Vegas, we sat in this bus station for an, a couple of hours. And then a random stranger just came up to my mother and started talking to her. And after a period of time of exchanging conversation, we ended up leaving the bus station and we ended up going to an apartment. And we stayed in this apartment for one week. And after this one week, the stranger, or this lady, went on about her own journey, and now my mother and I are left with trying to find a solution as to what to do now. And after that, 
life just threw us into a boxing match. So the day we became, we, we, left, uh, we left from this apartment is the day we became homeless. And we went from staying in a shelter in Las Vegas for a couple of months, moving to Las Vegas, uh, sorry, moving to Los Angeles for a couple of months, moving back to Las Vegas for a couple of months, moving back to Los Angeles again for another couple of months. So there's a lot of back and forth. And a lot of these things, a lot of these experiences that I came across here in, uh, in between these two places, we were homeless, we were sleeping in, in and out of shelters. Some days we went without eating. Some days we didn't know where we were going to sleep. Some days we were sleeping outside. My mother wasn't able to get a job. All right, didn't have a lot of income. Sometimes I had to panhandle and beg for money just so simply, just, just so I can eat. And also, we came across different kinds of environments. And one environment that I really want to talk about here is the one in Los Angeles, and that is Skid Row. Okay, we lived in this environment for a couple of months as well. And I must say, Skid Row is not a place for any kid to be. Now, raise your hand if you've heard of Skid Row in Los Angeles, California. Okay, one, two, three. Right, so to give you an overview of what Skid Row is in Los Angeles, California, it is a two to three mile radius in the heart of downtown Los Angeles where people have given up on themselves, people are sub on substance abuse, people are battling with their own inner demons, people who are mentally in another place or in another world, people in a low frame of mind, people who probably just say, you know what, that's it for me, this is where I belong. And there is absolutely no hope, there's no inspiration, there's no motivation, there's absolutely nothing there that you could walk into this environment and feel inspired by. Nothing at all. It's hard-nosed lessons. And also, too, if you walk around this area as well, there's like a stench, it's very strong. And it's not just in one area, it's in the whole entire area of downtown Los Angeles, in Skid Row, that is. All right? And so it's, it's very adverse. And I just, I just advise like, you guys just look into it and just kind of see what it's about. And after a period of moving back and forth and, and going into different environments, my mother then decided to try and go to Florida. And by this point now, it's eight, nine months after we've arrived in America. Right, so the last thing we want to do is be caught up, and which leads me into this next story. So we take a bus from Los Angeles, California, in an attempt to get to Florida, and we get to Texas, and we, get st we, we, we leave from El Paso, Texas, which is all the way on the east coast, sorry, on the west of Texas, and we leave from El Paso, and we come across a port, and this, on this port, I remember sitting in the back of the bus and I was reading what it said on the logo. It said United States Homeland and Immigration Security. And when I read that, my heart dropped because I just knew we are in some sort of sticky situation now. So the bus stops. Remember the immigration officers walking around, getting onto the bus and they got onto the bus and they're screaming from the front. Please make sure you have all your documents. We're going to be walking around, and if you don't have the right documents, we're going, to ask, we're going to have to ask you to get off. And I'm sitting in the back. My heart is pounding. Do do, do do, do do. And they start walking around. They get to my mother, spend way more time on my mom than they did on anybody else, and they ask us to get off. And getting off the bus, it was kind of like, uh oh. We're in trouble, right? So remember, getting off the bus, we take our bags from underneath the bus, right? And then the bus leaves, and now it's just my mother, our bags, and this immigration port in the middle of nowhere. When I mean in the middle of nowhere, I'm talking about a building in the middle of the Sahara Desert somewhere. And you're like, what's this building doing here? And we get in this port, spend a couple of hours, and they put us on, they put us on this van that had seven other I guess, refugees or immigrants that they have caught, and they send us back to El Paso. And we stay in El Paso for about 30 days. And within those 30 days, we see an immigration officer, and this immigration officer told us that we have been deported and we're no longer allowed to stay in the country. 
So at the age of 12, hearing this news, where I felt defenseless, it was like, what do we do? I didn't know what to do. I didn't ask for any of this. And I didn't know whether to be upset or whether to just be humble enough and to just take, take on this journey and whatever happens is whatever happens. But I chose the second part, just stay humble and let's just find something out of this. So shortly after that interview, they didn't send us to England or they didn't send us back right then and there. They gave, kind of gave us a chance to leave. So my mother decides to take us back to Los Angeles, California, where we experience everything all over again, being back at square one. In fact, this time, I was just running away most of the time. I'll panhandle, ask for some money, and I'll just go take a bus or a train somewhere. Most, most days, most times. And I'll say that during these times, I was alone a lot, a lot. And yes, it's, it sucks to be alone, but sometimes being alone, yeah, you, you begin to learn how to deal with your own company. You have to, deal with, you have to learn how to deal with being uncomfortable. And it's not easy to be alone. I know this. But sometimes you find, you find yourself when you're alone. All right? And so uh, after, I thought this nightmare would never end. But eventually it did. Eventually it did. And how it ended was I just came from being out all night. And I met up with my mom the next day. Somehow, some way, I didn't, it wasn't intentional. I, I just, I'd just taken a train from Long Beach, California and got to downtown Los Angeles. And I walked to a shelter in which we used to stay at, but we wasn't staying there. And to my surprise, I saw my mother in there and I was like, oh, nice to see you. Sometimes I, sometimes I went for not seeing my mom for about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and that was just the kind of person, the kind of journey I was on. And so when I saw my mom, it was very surprising. And um, I was like, okay, cool, nice to see you. But then after uh, some time, we ended up leaving from the shelter. It's called Ununion Rescue Mission in the heart of Skid Row. And we had left the shelter and we had walked. We started to make our journey to where my mom wanted to go. And I remember walking past the shelter and they were serving food at the time. And I asked my mom, mom, can we go in here and get some food? And she said, no. So I had, I had to think about it for a second. I had, to, I had to meet a decision. And it was either to stay down this path in which is, is, is leading to these certain kind of outcomes, or it was either to go into the shelter and get some food. And I, and I walked into the shelter. I decided to go into the shelter, get some food. My mom never came back. And it was like, all right, my mom's gone. I'm just here by myself. Let's, let's, whatever happens is whatever happens. And I get into the shelter, get some food, and I come out, and I kid you not, this is all I had. I had a 150 to 200 gallon trash bag, just filled with clothes. No money, no phone, no bus pass, no address, no identification. Literally 12 years old at rock bottom. Right? And now I'm in a situation where I have to try and figure out how to navigate through more uncertainty. So I remember making a right out the shelter and then I made a left down the main street. And I, w I made a left down the main street and I walked to the corner and what I saw was unbelievable. What I saw is that my mom is on the bus heading to where she wanted to go to. So I'm standing here on this corner and I'm assessing this whole situation like, what do I do? So I see that there's a bus stop down the street and I'm thinking, okay, maybe do I run to the bus? Does my mom get off the bus? But instead, here's what happens. So the bus got to the bus stop, saw no sign of my mom, and the bus kept going. So now 12 years old in the heart of Skid Row, watching this bus go, go, and go till it's out of sight. I can't even describe to you what it feels like to be abandoned. But I can tell you right now that what it feels like is that you feel like you are worth nothing. And just to stop it right there, I want to tell each and every single person in this room that you are worth something, no matter what happens to you. Uh, you are worth something. You, 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 everyone in this room, all right? You're worth something. I just thought I might tell you that. But standing here on this corner to witness all of this stuff and being in this environment as well, right? I had a series of decisions to make. 
And it was looking around, I was looking around the environment and I saw people doing this, doing that. Some people across the street doing whatever they was doing. Some people walking by, right? And I could have easily became frustrated, easily became angry. I could have easily thrown in a towel. I said, you know what? Put my hands up, became pissed off, right? But instead I chose not to because I knew in here, in my heart, I deserve something, right? I deserve something. And that was what guided me through making the decision in that moment. So instead of getting pissed off and throwing in the towel, I decided to just go look for somewhere to sleep. And I looked for shelter. And I come across three shelters. The first, all three of them turned me away because I was under the age of 18. However, though, it was the third one that said, even though we turned you away, we're going to try and help you out anyway. And what they did was they called the police. Police came and picked me up. And we went on a search for my mom. Couldn't find her. And bearing in mind, we had just been deported. So I'm already, like, anxious. I'm, I'm scared. Like, all they have to do is type my name in. They might just turn me in and say, oh, there's this kid. We found him. Now we just need to find him. All sorts of, you can see how that creates this, the, a pattern of negative thinking. But thankfully, that didn't happen. So instead, we ended up going on the search for my mom. Couldn't find her. And then we get to the police station, sat there for four hours, four, and four or five hours, right? No money, no phone, no bus pass, nothing. Didn't have an identification, nothing. All I had was a trash bag, right? And waited to the end of the night, only for a social worker to come and pick me up and basically make a long story short to be found that I was now in the foster care system. And from there, life just took a complete 180. Had a bit more stability, started going to school, started playing sports, overcame the deportation case. My mom basically tried to turn herself in, right? And I tried to get me back to go to England. It didn't work, basically backfired. And so I stayed in, I stayed in America and had all this like, life turn around and, and, and positivity stuff happen. My mom got sent back to England. I didn't know how to take it. I know it was an unfortunate situation. I couldn't say anything at the time. But I tried to remain positive, all right, throughout my journey. I actually started playing American football at first. Any American football fans in here? What team do you support? Uh, it's a local team. American football. Miami Dolphins, okay. I grew up watching San Diego Chargers. A little bit. Any San Diego Chargers? In, any San Diego Chargers fans in here? No. That's fine. Anybody else follow American football? No. To be fair, American football is long. You know what I mean? Like, it's, that game lasts about three hours. And sometimes it doesn't even need to last three hours. I wish it just had a running clock. That's it. I wish it did. Right? <laughs> but I started playing American football. But then after starting to watch basketball, I started getting into it. And I think this is what actually got me into basketball. So let's just picture this. Let's just picture being in the NBA arena. This is the first round of the NBA playoff game. And this is against, uh, this is Los Angeles Lakers versus Phoenix Suns in the 2000, is this six or seven playoffs? Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, it's going to come to you in a minute. Basically, it was a jump ball and it was like five seconds left. I'm not sure, well, some, maybe some of you guys know the players, but Kobe Bryant, definitely. Kobe Bryant was on the other side of the, of the jump circle, and Lakers were scoring that way. And it was a jump ball, a tip ball, and Lakers had won a tip, five seconds left on the clock. Kobe decides to dribble from that side of the court to the right elbow, shoots a fadeaway, and he made it on a buzzer beater. 3-1, Lakers win, move on to the next round. But I kid you not, when I saw that, I was absolutely inspired. I was like, what? Fans were going crazy. Kobe Bryant, ah! Everybody all over Kobe Bryant. It's like all sorts of balloons and stuff falling from the ceiling. That was probably, to be fair, that era of basketball between 2007 to 2013. Ain't nothing else like it. 
We're talking about Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan, Dirk Nowinski, um, what other, Steve Nash, uh, we're talking about Kobe Bryant as well, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Prime. Man, that was the best era of basketball, I think. At least I think so. Amir Studmeyer, uh, Carmelo Anthony, some of the guys that you see now today. Been in the league for a while, right? And they've been doing what they've been doing. Russell Westbrook was a completely different animal then than he is now. Even Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant was young, but people was thinking, wow, this is going to be a superstar. I'm not even sure if Steph Curry entered the league. I think he entered the league around 2011, 2012 or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. No, actually, he's been in there a bit longer. What am I talking about? He's been in there longer. But watching this era of basketball is what inspired me to play basketball. And then I just took basketball and used that as a vehicle for whatever it is that I wanted to do. Whether it was to go to college and play basketball and get a college scholarship, knowing that I had big dreams set out and stuff, and just using that as fuel to be successful, right? And so um, I enjoyed that. That was my favorite time of the year. Favorite time in terms of basketball. And uh, after that, set my dreams out. I, I got some college scholarship opportunities. I went to, after, after graduating high school, I went to Texas to play at a junior college. Now, junior college, I'm just going to give it to you in a nutshell. Does anybody know what junior college is? Yeah, some know. Yeah, kind of know. All right. Junior college is basically a stepping stone to a four-year university. It's not a prep school. It's basically the first two years of a four-year university. So let's say um, Iowa State is a four-year university. Okay, it's a four. You have your freshman year, your sophomore year, your junior year, and your senior year. Four years. Junior college, or that system, covers your first two years, your freshman and your sophomore year. And then if you transfer to a four-year university, you only transfer your, to a four-year university to finish off your junior and your senior year. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, perfect. So that's the route that I took. I took a junior college route to finish the first two years, or to start my first two years of university, and then I transferred to Iowa State. And I played at a junior college called uh, Tyler Junior College, that is actually. Uh, played there for two years, um, found out I had some siblings, uh, found out my dad was, uh, who, who he was, and then who, who his family was, or who her family was. Funny enough, um, I found out that I had a stepsister who went to the same exact school that I did, and we had no clue, had no clue, which is very strange. Very strange, but very coincidental as well. And that was probably another eye-opener to kind of confirm that I'm on the right journey. And then after, so, so after two years of being at junior college, then it was Iowa State, and then all my experiences at Iowa State, to then getting a contract offer to play for Bristol. And the reason I moved to Bristol was simply because I found out, like I said earlier, I had two siblings. I didn't grow up with them. But then I found out my sister actually lives in Bath and my brother's in London. So it just made more sense to, to make that decision, make that jump, come to Bristol and connect with family and stuff like that. And also my mom as well. Um, so I kind of made decision based on that and not just around basketball. And then after that, um, all the good stuff just kind of came. So I guess to kind of summarize it a little bit, okay, tools for success. Uh, I just want to sh I, I share three to four tools for success. Number one, purpose, all right? Define your purpose. Why do you want to be great? And what's going to motivate you when you don't have no motivation to be great? Uh, or why do you want to do the thing that you're doing? Shape that. Some of you young, young, young ones in here, start understanding that now. Why do you want to play basketball? Why do you want to do this? Or why do you want to do that? What is your purpose? And your purpose has to be deep. It has to be meaningful. Like I said before, when it means enough to you, you celebrate harder as opposed to when it doesn't. So make sure that purpose has a meaning that means enough to you. All right, so that's number one, your purpose. Number two, personal development. I'm big on this. I believe that nothing's going to get better until you decide to make the choice to get better or to better yourself. Stop making those excuses as to, oh, I don't want to do that, I can't do it. Stop making those excuses. Stop finding reasons why you should or why you can do that. Okay, so if that means going on a run to become more extra fit or doing a bit more shooting so you can become a better, better shooter or whatever that purpose is, whatever that reason is, 
Invest in yourself. Invest that time in yourself to make sure that you are personally developing and you're personally getting better. All right? Personal development. Number three, keep a positive mindset. Keep a positive mindset. Certain things in life aren't going to be easy. I get it. I get it. Some things suck. School sucks. I get it. But you got to keep a positive mindset in school. Why? Because it might have, it might come back and haunt you. And you don't want, you don't want to do that. You don't want to let it come back and haunt you. I know when I was in school in America, yeah, I didn't like it. I had to take some boring SATs and whatever exams I needed to take to get into college. But once I got through that stuff, hey, college was sweet. I couldn't complain, all right? So make sure you keep a positive mindset no matter what happens, okay? Even in basketball when you're playing a game and your shot isn't falling or maybe you're struggling to score or maybe you just don't have it today. Keep a positive mindset. Support someone else and maybe that will actually pay off dividends uh, quicker than you actually know. All right, so that's number three. And I'll say the last one. Sorry, I could go on a bit more. But the last one, seek more than just the ordinary. All right, as I mentioned before, how are you going to get better if you're not putting in that extra work, that extra bit of work that you actually need to do? All right, how are you going to get better? How are you actually going to get better? And I'm going to leave it on that note. Uh, but however, I just want to say, everybody in this room has potential. You have the ability to grow and transcend, and you have everything in your toolbox that you need to become successful, whether in sport or even in life, in business, in school, or whatever it is that you want to create for yourself in the future. But the secret is making sure that you take action, and then the other part of it is believing, all right? So I would just, I'd like to say thank you so much for you guys' time tonight. I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys did as well. And do whatever you need to do to be great. All right. Appreciate it. Sure. If, if, if someone asks, just repeat the question. For the, the, the okay. So does anyone have any questions for Dan? Yeah, Abdi? What was my purpose to become great. become great? What was my purpose? My purpose. My purpose is knowing that where I came from, I guess, when I, like I told you, when I think about my journey and where I've been, like, I've come too far for this. And my purpose is always to know that I am worth something, so I'm not going to let my experiences tell me that I'm worth nothing because deep down I'm not built for nothing. I am built for a specific reason. I'm going to find it. And whatever that reason is, whether it's to come in here and be motivational or to put a smile on someone else's face or maybe to even be a role model to some people who need some sort of inspiration or somebody to look up to. Like, I can't give up. So because, because some people are going to look towards, or trying to look to people who aren't giving up as well based on where they came from. So that's my purpose. Anyone else? All right, so again, thank you very much for coming down. Again, give a round of applause for Dan and his time. So, right. so appreciate it. Is that good? Um,